My dear friends, uh, when I was a child, growing up in Jacksonville, Florida, tennis was my sport. Uh, my doubles partner and I even cracked the top 20 as young teens in Florida. I was on scholarship at the prep school we played for, but before this sounds self-aggrandizing, please know that by the time I entered high school, the younger talent surpassed me with each passing year and I lost my scholarship. But nonetheless, my doubles partner, Barry, and I would travel to tournaments every weekend and our Jewish families became the closest of friends in the 1970s. We were involved with our temple youth group, Jafti, since my dad was the rabbi in Cantor and was a pal of Barry's dad, who died young. Barry and I went our separate ways in college, and as so often happens, we lost touch. After my 11 years of college and graduate school and rabbinical school, an old friend, another one, called me and asked, hey, Micah, are you in touch with Barry? Remember, there was no Facebook yet or instant <laughs> communication in the early 90s. I said, no, I'm sorry to say that I haven't been in touch with Barry for years. Why? Well, you may want to reach out because he's battling a serious illness. It's not AIDS, so don't think that just because he's gay. Barry is gay, I replied. My friend said, how could you not know? I answered, you're right. How could I not know? I reached Barry in Chicago. He was pleasantly surprised to hear from me. And when I asked if we could meet on my way to or from a national rabbinic meeting via Chicago, he said, sure, we can meet at O'Hare. There's actually a good restaurant there. We sat down. I said, I hear you're sick, old friend, and I'm praying for your health and strength and well-being. He said, I appreciate that. I said, Barry, what also saddens me is that you're my oldest childhood friend, and I never knew you were gay. Are you disappointed? Barry asked. Yes, I said, in myself. Please forgive me for making it hard to confide in me. I am so proud of who you are, Barry, not just because you were the better doubles player. <laughs> you made everything more fun when we were around each other. Barry died a few years later. But after all these years, I still think of him often. I think of him when I'm around teen boys in the alpha male culture that still exists and which I guess Barry witnessed me break into, you know, striving to be the man women want, a culture that encourages winning tennis tournaments, playing football and basketball, yet prevents great guys like Barry from coming out of the shadows. It pains me that because of the prom dates and girlfriends he heard me pine for, one who I thought was my best friend did not feel safe telling me something as central as his identity. That is my shame, not only personally, but for my Florida synagogue and for the Jewish people as a whole. Because every LGBTQ plus member of this Jewish faith family is our pride, not our shame, our prize our treasure, our honor. There's a story in the Talmud, in chapter four of Masechet Derech Eretz, which relates that when the great rabbi Shimon ben Elazar was coming from his teacher's house in a place named Migdal Elder, he was riding leisurely, this rabbi, on his horse by the seaside. And a certain man chanced to meet him, and the man was exceedingly ugly, according to the Talmud. And Rabbi Shimon said to him, Raka, which means simpleton, how ugly are the children of Abraham, our father? The other man replied, 
Speak to the craftsman who made me, sir. Rabbi Shimon immediately dismounted from his horse and bowed before the man and said, I apologize to you, forgive me. The man replied to Rabbi Shimon, not knowing that he was a rabbi, I will not forgive you until you go to the craftsman who made me and say, how ugly is this human vessel, this image which you have made? Rabbi Shimon walked behind the man for three miles, according to the Talmud. When the people in the next town heard of the imminent arrival of this well-known sage, Rabbi Shimon, they came out to meet him and greeted him with the words that you said earlier, Shalom Alecha Rab, peace be unto you, Rabbi. Thereupon, the seemingly ugly man said to the crowd, who are you calling Rabbi? And they answered, the man walking behind you. It's the great Rabbi Shimon Elazar. And the man exclaimed, if this man is a rabbi, may there not be any more like him in Israel. It's in the Talmud. And he told the people the whole story about what happened, and they begged him to forgive the rabbi. And the man agreed on one condition, that Rabbi Shimon ben al never act in this manner again. P.S., I think Rabbi Shimon changed. How do we know? Among the most famous lines he left us is this gem, and I quote from Rabbi Shimon later in his life. He who was prompted by love to perform religious acts and ethical acts is greater than he who was prompted by fear. The craftsman we call God created all kinds of people, all kinds of humans to love, accept, and welcome. Diversity is not only what makes each of us special, it is what makes us unique children of the same parent with a capital P we call God. Diversity is our strength and our greatest hope. It is what makes us a kihila kedosha, a holy community. Rabbi Harris Goldstein restated the seemingly ugly man's words this way in his book, Being a Blessing. Rabbi Goldstein writes, and I quote, it is not up to you to judge people based on the color of their skin or their gender or their sexual orientation. If you have a problem with the fact that a person is gay or a woman or a different skin color, discuss your problem with the one who created people to be different. Just remember that your problem is not with the created, but with the creator. My dear friends, the defining issue for our time is clearly how we treat the other, only one of which concerns LGBTQ plus people because the other is any other human. And understanding that from God's standpoint, there is no other. What we share with the Jewish conception of one God, um, with God, is a moral framework. You've heard Micah 6, 8 over and over again. To do justly, love mercy, walk humbly. Sometimes it's not even clear in the Torah, though, who is even talking, doing the blessing, or being blessed. Like this week in the Torah, when the priestly benediction, may the Lord bless thee and keep thee, the translation is usually that, from number six, may the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the original, in the Torah this week, it's composed of three Hebrew lines. Each line contains two verbs with the name of God in the middle. The first line has three Hebrew words, The second line has five, And the third line has seven, which is the numerical symbol of creation. And as the length 
of this verse in the Bible grows. So too we are told, each of the three lines contains a blessing more generous than the one preceding. Let's take the first one. May the Lord bless you and keep you. You know what the rabbis say that's for? Material stuff like food and shelter. We ask God to free us from hunger and distress. Now, if that doesn't seem like a big deal to you, think of the 47% of the children in Shelby County who live in poverty. They've yet to realize the first line of the priestly benediction. But even those of us well off who are wise enough know that the material is the lowest blessing because people can all too easily become possessed by their possessions. That's why the second line with five words is considered even greater. May the light of God's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. This refers to spiritual blessing, the enlightenment and wisdom which comes from focusing on what really matters through living a life of mitzvah, we say, guideposts to uplift our lives and other people's lives with meaning and purpose, guideposts which have no room for bigotry and value equality and acceptance. And of course, the blessing reaches its high point in the third line, a life at one with everything and everyone. May God's face be lifted toward you and grant you shalom, which doesn't just mean hello or goodbye, as in shalom, y'all. Shalom means wholeness, completeness, unity. And think about it. The entire priestly benediction rests on shalom. Why? Because as Judaism teaches, The end of all blessings is peace. Besides, God, though, the only other term repeated in the blessing, besides the word God, you know what the word that's repeated is, if you were listening? Face. We ask God to cause his face to shine upon us and then to lift up God's face upon us. But since God has no body, no arm, no hand, certainly no face in a physical sense, What do we mean by God's face? Now, here's something very interesting they didn't teach you in Hebrew school. The Hebrew word for face, panim, is always in the plural because the word face requires an encounter with another. My face comes into full being when it faces another person and meets another face. When I really stand in the presence and face you, see you. Our very being is defined by being in the presence of others. So it is with God. God does not have a face in any literal sense. God has a presence. There are moments when we feel that we're living in the presence of God, when God's presence is shining upon us. But my friends, as an ally of the LGBTQ plus community, We need to come to know the faces of our Jewish brothers and sisters who are LGBTQ+. And I'm so proud on this Pride Shabbat that our temple at Crosstown during Passover and throughout the days and weeks and years ahead celebrates the rich diversity of our congregation, including and especially some of the most gifted leaders of our congregation who are Jewish and happen to be LGBTQ+. So we're all going to have to look for those moments when God's presence is right in front of us or when we feel God's presence. And that's what happened when I met Barry at O'Hare Airport before he died. I blessed him the way we're always supposed to offer this blessing According to the early rabbis, we're supposed to offer the threefold benediction, remember the three lines? In three ways. You guessed it, face to face. Panim el panim. Not like, I'm praying for you. Face to face. Not via text or email. 
face to face. The second way we're supposed to offer this prayer is be'ahava, not the skincare products, ahava. Ahava means love, and meaning you're supposed to offer it with sincere love, not disingenuously, not perfunctorily, not mechanically, but with love. And the third and final way to offer this blessing, we just offered upon our new baby Jake, is with outstretched hands, benisiat kapayim. So first, we must face the person we're blessing to grant recognition. It also has to touch the heart with love. And finally, you have to transcend just your heart and activate your hands. My friends, we are commanded as Jews to see those who are unseen and ignored and marginalized in our presence. We are commanded to reach out and make the invisible visible in our midst so that we may fulfill the Torah's mandate of not overlooking others who are hurting, whether they pray like us, look like us, or are like us. I shared with a friend before I close this week, I shared with a friend who loves how beautiful our temple is, a higher compliment. I quoted Anayat Khan who said, some people look for a beautiful place. Others make a place beautiful. To all the members of the Temple Israel family who were, who were created LGBTQ plus by the craftsmen mentioned in the Talmud, thank you for making this place beautiful whether gay or straight, Jew by choice, or Jew by chance, by each of us, may each of us here be blessed to be a part of this precious legacy and faith. And may each of us keep it vibrant and alive and relevant and resonant and purposeful and meaningful from downtown and midtown to crosstown and this main TI campus, may every him and her and he and she become what those Shabbat candles lit by the Chipman Kalin family symbolize. May we all become lights of compassion, lights of goodness, lights of human decency, lights of mitzvah, lights of Judaism, lights of love, and let us all say, Amen.